get started. I want to introduce uh, our uh, assistant professor, our guest for grand rounds, uh, Dr. Hunt, Sandy Hunt. This is the first time I can do the call. Hey, it was the first time I can call, but my memory's short. Um, our own resident coming back to give us uh, grand rounds. Um, so it's been particularly fun for, uh, for me to have Ken back. Uh, Dr. Hunt graduated from this program uh, almost 15 years ago, uh, 2008, and uh, did a point fellowship and then worked at Stanford for seven years uh, in academics and uh, was well integrated there uh, for that period of time and then moved uh, to the University of Colorado in Denver and has been there for the last eight years. And uh, he's a nationally recognized 120 plus. Uh, first author through publication, not first author, but peer reviewed publications of which are well over 40 the first author. He's uh, very integrated in the labs uh, there at his institution, but also nationally integrated in the world. Uh, one of the things I uh, was chatting with Ken about last summer at the meeting we were at uh, was his role as vice chair of quality, uh, safety, and outcomes. And uh, as we were chatting, I realized that he has this new system is more complex than ours. Their main group is about our size, but then they've integrated a lot of other private practice groups and the hospital system has grown and bought other, other hospitals around, around Metro Odessa and beyond. And uh, one of the things they've done is to make Ken in charge of quality, safety, and outcomes across that entire system for Muscatello, which is a lot more complex because he has all of that responsibility and almost no authority. <laughs> but that said, um, I think there's a lot for us to learn about quality and outcomes uh, from what his experience has been as vice chair uh, and responsible for that. And so, therefore, I was going to come and give us that talk today. Ken, thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. It's great to have you back. Great to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Daryl, uh, for that kind introduction. It's really an honor for me to be here, to be back. Um, uh, uh, Daryl, you've been an incredibly gracious host, so thank you for, um, for having me uh, here to, uh, to speak with you. So um, this is being videotaped. This is without makeup right here. So, um, so uh, no relevant disclosures to this except, as Daryl mentioned, I'm a graduate of this program. Uh, so I, I graduated in 2008. Um, I have very fond memories and still very good relationships, not only with my classmates, but with faculty members and uh, residents from other classes. Um, we had a, a lot of fun. We learned a lot. It was not just orthopedics that we learned. There was arm wrestling. <coughs> um, for those who do not, uh, for those who, uh, for the residents up here in the front, that is an iPod. <laughs> um, Daryl, that's what replaced the A-track. So <coughs> um, now smartphones, you can play your music from anywhere. So we learned arm wrestling. Uh, we learned guitar. Uh, we learned a little bit of sword play. And uh, we learned to just be thoughtful and pensive. <clears throat> or maybe this is a pose, I can't really tell. Um, so as Daryl mentioned, I went on to my foot and ankle fellowship at Ortho Carolina with uh, Bob Anderson and Hodges Davis and, and their team. I went on, I started um, on faculty at Stanford, had a really nice experience there, um, kind of cut my teeth as, as it were, and then I was recruited to Colorado um, for, to kind of build a foot and ankle program. Um, and so I work with a couple of people. Some of you may recognize these two. They're, they're my partners and both kind of pass through here as part of their, as part of their training. Um, but I also have had some, some cool experiences. I've, I've taken care of the CU football team, which has been especially interesting over the past year uh, with our new coach. Um, and I've, I've had the opportunity to be one of the team. Uh, oh, and oh, sorry, we, got to, uh, we did have some visitors on occasion every other year, uh, some recognizable faces there. And then I've also had the opportunity to be a team doc for the Nuggets, and we had a fun year last year. So it's been a really nice experience for us, um, uh, for me and for my family. Um, as Daryl mentioned, one of the hats that I wear is Vice Chair of Quality, Patient Safety, and Outcomes. And Daryl asked me to come and talk to you a little bit about how we built that quality program uh, and how I think that that's meaningful, particularly to an academic uh, orthopedic department. Um, so I, I have to first acknowledge and thank Charlie um, this, my interest in, in quality and outcomes actually started in Bob Anderson's kitchen when Charlie was the president-elect for the a AOFAS. And so they had a leadership retreat. They invited the fellows when I was a fellow. And um, he showed me the promise. He introduced me to promise. We actually got on there. I filled out a survey. And that really sparked my interest. 
And so when I went into practice, it was with that mindset. So I've been thinking about this since I was a fellow, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that evolved. So I'm going to go through this. I'm first going to talk about how we define quality. <clears throat> That's a, a little bit dry, but it's important to understand you know, how quality is defined, how we measure quality, and then how we collect data, and how we will ultimately collect data uh, in, the, in the long term. Um, so I'm going to start uh, by asking Andrea. So I'm going to go through two cases. This was in the, my first year of practice. These two cases I saw on the same day, and, um, and I tracked them. And, uh, and so um, we're going to talk about this. So this was a 59-year-old female, uh, fell, uh, had a fall 20 years prior, and this is her ankle. So Andrea, what do you see? Overall, I don't see any major breaks. The ankle was located. Um, maybe a little bit of osteoarthritis. Yeah, very good. Osteoarthritis. There's an anterior osteophyte, a loss of joint space. Um, so, yeah, this is a post traumatic arthritis. Looks like there might have been an old fracture line. Very good. And then, Anne, and you, you, you showed up early. It was great. You were the first ones here, and so I got to meet you both, and that's why I know you. Sorry. Um, so this was the second patient, same age, male, also post-traumatic, and what do you see? Um, looks like more advanced OA, um, bordering on like an autofusion. <clears throat> Very good, yeah, so this is more advanced arthritis, you associate that with more stiffness. Do you think this uh, is more painful or less painful than the other patient? Um, I'm not sure, if it's, if it's used, then less, but if it's just more advanced OA, with um, still some existing joint and more. Very good. So you can't tell by the x-ray, right? So at the time, we were administering the foot function index, and this is one of those funny indices that a, a lower score is better. And so both of these patients filled out their FFI. And the first patient was highly disabled, uh, was not able to perform a lot of the functions. And the other patient was actually doing pretty well. I think to your point, Ann, there was almost an autofusion. So there wasn't a lot of motion. So he was in a brace and he wasn't all that painful. And so, um, but it's interesting to see the radiographs don't always predict it, and so that's not how we're going to make our decisions, and it's certainly not how we're going to measure outcomes. Um, so uh, the, the first patient had a more severe dysfunction. I ultimately did uh, an ankle replacement. She did well. The other one had less dysfunction. I injected him every couple of years, and he did well up until I left. So it just underscores that um, what we're aiming for is the best outcome for a patient, not necessarily for an x-ray or for what we, what we think the outcome should be. The World Health Organization defines quality as the extent to which healthcare services provide individuals and populations improved desired health outcomes. Now, that's really, really important. What we're trying to get to is where the patient wants to get to, and that's where the assessments preoperatively or at, at an index visit becomes really important. And what I found is that in order for us to do this, it has to be a collaboration. So we care about this, we want good outcomes. Hospitals also want good outcomes and they want revenue and that becomes increasingly important. So um, this is really a collaboration between a health system and, uh, and a department or a group of providers. So within the definition of quality, there are key elements that are, that are defined this way. Um, effectiveness, patient-centered care and safety, we can really control. Uh, and we can assess. You know, that, that's really, we have power there. Timely access efficiently and equitable care, that's more of a health system consideration that's measured by patient experiences and, and quality databases that I'll get into. Um, and so we have to have an awareness of this, um, and we can, but we can only control where we can control. Um, so we put together a review article that's in the uh, Academy Journal from a couple of years ago um, that goes through what exists currently, like what quality measures exist, uh, what um, you know, payment programs exist, and, uh, and I'll tell you that a lot of what was in there two years ago, almost three years ago, is dated. So the, 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 um, the world is moving very rapidly. In general, there are three domains for assessing quality. Uh, one is structure. That's mainly the hospital infrastructure, the electronic medical record, things that exist uh, to help us care for patients. And then there are processes. For example, the percent of patients that receive their perioperative antibiotics, the percent that receive the appropriate DVT prophylaxis following a surgery, and then there are outcomes, so that we know we're most familiar with patient-reported outcome metrics, uh, but looking at complications, looking at readmission, uh, looking at patient satisfaction, those all, all play into outcomes. So what's interesting is that in orthopedics, the majority of quality metrics in place are process metrics. There actually aren't that many required outcome metrics, although that landscape is changing, um, as I'll talk about. Um, so why should this matter to everyone in this room? 
Like, why should we care about quality? Um, well, first and foremost, we all want great outcomes. Like, we want our patients to do well. It's what drives us to do our job. It's what gives us our professional satisfaction. And it reduces the difficult conversations for patients that, that, that don't do well. Uh, for the residents, this is going to be a requirement when you do your boards. Um, so uh, for board certification, your patients during that period will be offered to track outcomes, and that will matter. That will make a difference. Um, payment programs are increasingly moving toward outcomes. Traditionally, payment programs, programs were process-oriented, so they wanted to make sure you were clicking the right boxes, including clicking the boxes for collecting PROs. But with this new program that just launched, the, the first voluntary reporting period for the uh, PROPM measure is right now, like it started this month. Um, and they're required not only that we track outcomes, but that those outcomes improve. And, and they're looking specifically at the coos and the hoos that it improves by 20 in order to get the additional payment. Now, this, is, this matters most to the hospital. It does not affect providers, but they will withhold a percentage of the hospital payment until you can prove that your outcomes are better. And, then and that's a pretty big check, so it matters to the hospital, but they need us not only to track it, but to make sure patients actually get better. <clears throat> and that, you know, I would anticipate that that will start spreading beyond just CMS as an insurer and beyond just hip and knee replacements um, to, uh, to other procedures that we do. Um, so at an academic setting, we're interested in outcomes research. Uh, and obviously, you, you know, thanks to, to Charlie's leadership, have uh, a very robust outcomes da database program. Um, patient education and satisfaction. And we really need, there's an increasing focus on value in healthcare. Um, so everyone's familiar with the value equation. Um, uh, first, I'll, I'll start with uh, Arnold Grellman, who is the, the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal at this time, um, wrote a, a nice article. It's a quick read on... Um, on the assessment and accountability as the third revolution in, in, uh, in medical care. So he said, we can no longer afford to provide healthcare without knowing more about its successes and failures. So he uh, deemed the current era the era of assessment accountability. Um, to back up, healthcare really started to expand uh, during and after World War II. More hospitals, more doctors, and the business of medicine really launched. And that led insurance companies and the federal payers to say, well, wait a minute, um, we're not just going to pay for this. We have to put a little bit more structure to this. So Medicare and Medicaid services were introduced, and insurance companies started to, to pop up. Um, and that led to significant expansion in costs. And so what Dr. Relman said was, there's rising costs, but is this actually adding benefit? And, and so he called this the era of assessment and accountability where we have to understand how are we improving lives and is the additional care, the additional cost of care actually providing value. Um, Michael Porter um, uh, defined value, the value equation. You're all familiar with this outcome over cost. Cost is pretty simple. That's the amount that health care, that, that's the expense. That's how much people are paying for it. Um, and that's, you know, everyone's seen a graphic like this. Every insurance company is increasing in... Um, in, in total spending by year. Um, they think that they, this is starting to cap out a little bit, but there's still you know, fairly significant growth for all insurers, not just private um, uh, and not just the federal payers, but for all payment programs and for cell pay. Um, so this is a very nice uh, survey actually that came out of this institution where um, uh, doctors, patients, and employers were all surveyed about who's responsible for this, who should be who should be responsible for reducing costs of care? And everyone said it's the health systems. So that, that was the, the biggest winner in all. But what was interesting is that patients gave themselves responsibility, physicians gave themselves responsibility, and employers gave themselves responsibility. So every group surveyed said, we have some responsibility in this, but it's really the payers. It's the health system and the payers because they control the dollars. Um, so looking more closely at the value equations on the outcome side, this one gets a little bit more challenging because, as I mentioned earlier, the outcome is really patient dependent. So it's not how, what I think they should be doing or when I think they're doing well based on x-rays. It's when they feel like they're doing well and they're doing what they want to be doing. And so the, the equation is actually a little more complicated. Now, we measure outcomes by uh, patient report outcome metrics, quality metrics, patient satisfaction. All of those matter, and we're, we're graded by all of those. But the cost side is different as well because it's not just the cost of that episode of care. But what about da downstream costs? Because it's possible you could have a more expensive procedure, but that's going to mitigate some of the downstream needs that would add additional expense. So it's a little bit more complicated than just what did, did this episode of care cost and what was this outcome, because there are downstream uh, issues on both sides that we have to be mindful of. 
So really the, the value equation is defined as quality and service over cost, but those, some of those costs can be either mitigated or increased downstream. Um, so in 2019, you know, we as a department began really paying attention to this, you know, and we, we, we needed, we knew that we needed a partner with the hospital to kind of figure out how best to, um, to, to kind of take on some of these new requirements of CMS and how to really understand how our providers are doing. And so my chair asked me to put together a quality patient safety and outcomes committee. And we kind of divided up on those lines. And so this was the responsibility for the committee. We put together charges. I recruited other members. Um, we hired staff to help support this because it, you know, this, this can't happen without good staff on both the department and the hospital side um, in order to, to kind of keep things running. And so we put together a committee. Um, I, I have one representative from every side of practice and from every section. Now, sometimes it's the same person. But, um, but I wanted to be inclusive. I wanted to make sure everyone was aware and everyone had the opportunity to, to participate. Um, uh, we meet as a group quarterly and then a lot of the work we do is task forces and, and smaller groups that can accomplish a task. I am one, I'm anti-meeting, like there are too many meetings <laughs> in medicine. And so I, I really try to keep this, um, I try, try to keep this to smaller task force groups in order to, um, in order to, uh, to, to get it done. So now we have to look, so we understand what quality means, we understand why it's important, we understand that there's a lot to understand or a lot to be knowledgeable about in quality, both uh, as providers and uh, as uh, workers within a system. And so how do we measure quality? So I'm gonna go back to how this all started. So Florence Nightingale is, uh, who was a nurse in the Crimean War, um, is often, she's the founder of nursing and, and attributed to the founder of outcomes. Um, so she noticed a very important outcome measure, and that was death, that 42% uh, of the soldiers that were injured on the batter, battlefield would, would not survive. And so she uh, introduced hygiene, better nutrition, uh, reduced crowding, put sheets between the soldiers, and, and basically provided nursing care. And the result was a significant reduction in mortality from 42% to 2%. So she was the first one to say, hey, you know, things aren't going well with this. We need to change the intervention and see if we get a better outcome, and she measured it and, and reported it. In, in orthopedics, it was Codman. So he was the first person in North America who really started paying attention to this and, uh, and recognized the necessity for details, outco detailed outcomes follow-up. So he defined what he called the end result idea, if not, why not? So if a, we need to follow patients until the end of their treatment, and if it didn't work, we need to understand why and how to make things better. Um, and that's really, really percolated. So our, our committee looks at, uh, you know, has roles in each of these. And I'll just, I'll just touch on this just so you kind of understand the, the infrastructure. So on the quality side, most of this is measured by requirement at the hospital. Now the majority of academic centers, including I'm assuming this one, um, report to Vizient. So that's all automated, it's done by the hospital, we have no control over it. Um, but what we realize is that Vizient uh, assigns uh, or attributes patients based on the procedure that they have. So for example, if, um, if we had a uh, mortality where an interventional radiologist did a kyphoplasty procedure on a patient with end-stage met metastatic cancer, the patient passed away, that's attributed to orthopedics. Um, if a neurosurgeon does a surgery and has an adverse event, that's attributed to orthopedics because the spine DRG comes to orthopedics. So we recognize that and we can't change that. But as a department, we wanted to understand how we were doing. So we knew that we had to build our own, our own dashboard um, because Vizient was sort of incomplete in that way. Um, and so we, we went to build our dashboard. We identified the metrics that were most important. Now again, what's important to the hospital is this. Like they wanna know how they're rated on the US news report. And mortality is a big part of that. The mortality, mortality rate is 25% of the US news rating um, for, um, which is a big deal. So they pay attention to that. And then these are the other metrics that they're held accountable for. They're all interesting to us as well. And so um, we, uh, we put that, we built our own dashboard that just has our providers. So it's separate from Vizient, but it just made more sense to me. It also includes other hospitals that are in our system and it includes um, you know, ambulatory procedures as well. So it's a little bit more inclusive and more meaningful to us, uh, even though it's separate from Vizient. So we put this together so we could see real time um, you know, how our patients are doing and how our providers are performing, and we can drill down by patient, by location, by provider, by date, et cetera. Um, so uh, patients are assessing quality as well, and this is difficult because 
it's we have no control over it, and and you know it's sometimes it's meaningless. Are you, are you all a press gaining institution? We're, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Stanford was, and I remember uh, uh, Bill Mooney, our chair at Stanford, used to say that you know people who fill out press gain are pe either people who have nothing else to do or they're mad, <laughs> and so it's typically not the patient that's doing well after their their Brostrom procedure six months later or whatever. So um, yeah. So you, you know you, you you know don't ever read your online ratings. No, I, it, it's um, but this is this is here to stay. So we're being assessed uh, uh, on all ends by patients, and this is public record and it's visible and. And um, so it's something you, you, you need to pay attention to. Um, so what about um, you know, making changes? So uh, again, Codman sort of defined it, but we didn't do a lot in orthopedics for a long time until the 1980s. So Harold Luft was uh, a UCSF um, uh, uh, researcher who, uh, who looked up the relationship between surgical volumes and mortality to see is there something that we can do to intervene to improve outcomes. And what he found was that length of stay for certain procedures was predictive of outcome. And now I thought this was fascinating. For total hip replacements, the average length of stay nationwide was three weeks in 1980, or leading up to 1980. We were doing a little bit better in the West than they did in the Northeast, but that's a, that's a long time. So they recognized that that was actually a factor in, in outcomes. And then you fast forward 30 years, and now outpatient total hips are commonplace. I don't, I don't think they're completely ubiquitous, but it's, it's much more common now, and it's very rare that a total hip will stay more than a day or two. Uh, and so action was taken that was largely financially driven, I'm sure, but, um, but it actually was, was action taken based on, uh, you know, based on a quality metric. Um, so patient safety is another one. This is a little more challenging in terms of how to measure it. So we put together a collaborative case review. So any um, anytime there's a mortality, we identify a, a complication. We use RL solutions, which is where, you know, uh, nurses and even residents and providers can identify uh, safety concerns. Uh, and so we meet once a month um, with uh, our orthopedic providers, those who took care of the patient, those from other specialties, nursing, ICU, um, and, and other service lines to discuss patients and how do we make the system better. So this is a non-punitive, non-finger pointing way to just uh, make improvements. So we review all mortalities, trends, safety events, and then we're able to take action. So this is sort of has served as a springboard for quality improvement projects. And I'll give an example. We had two patients who had severe reactions to vancomycin perioperatively. They were all penicillin allergic, and it was just, it, we would just do vanco for penicillin allergic patients. So we looked back and we said, well, well is that a problem? So we looked at total hips and knees um, with penicillin allergies. Most of them were still given cefazolin with a test dose, and, and uh, others were given another antibiotic. And uh, what we found was that the infection rate and the hypersensitivity rate, rate was actually higher in patients who received a different antibiotic. So, so ANSEF was probably the safer choice, even in penicillin allergic, not in, in uh, ANSEF allergic. So we did a prospective study um, where we looked at penicillin allergic patients across all specialties, including foot and ankle, spine, um, and other elective specialties. Um, and, uh, and we would assess for hypersensitivity reactions uh, during or immediately following surgery. And what we found was that none of the 521 penicillin allergic cases had reactions. And, um, and 12 of them had an immediate reaction, but the second dose did not, um, you know, did not make it worse. And so uh, zero was our final number. So this actually uh, allowed us to build a new perioperative antibiotic pr protocol where vancomycin, we stopped using it because we had two major issues with it. And, um, and so we percolated that around all of our ORs and, and that's now in place. So there's a way to take action to improve outcomes even though the metrics are not always as clear. Um, so we also uh, serve as uh, the committee that reviews patient safety concerns uh, system-wide. So we'll have, um, you know, if we have a provider uh, in one of our ancillary uh, systems that's not part of our group that, that has some abnormal billing practices, We'll review that, and we'll look at it and, um, and provide advice to the group on how to manage it. Uh, notices of claim, that's when you know, a patient um, you know, basically says, you know, I was wronged and I'm, I'm claiming damages. So we review that to see, was there uh, a, a medical error? Was there, is there some way that we can improve? And uh, we'll review the case. So it, it, it allows us, it gives us a central process to manage these concerns and to, to better understand it from a medical, from a medical staff perspective. Um, and then finally, outcomes. And this is really, this has been my passion. Um, and so I, I enjoy this. It's, it's only a part of what we do. 
but I think it's a really important part. Uh, so again, out outcomes early on, before the 1990s, outcomes were, you know, did the patient survive? Did they, did they keep their limb? Were they able to get back to work? Um, it was pretty simple and it was pretty blunt. It wasn't until the 1990s that these patient-reported outcome metrics were really introduced. Um, and they, they are in multiple domains, so we could start looking at pain, physical function, social function, mental health. Uh, sports be became a really important part of this. So um, it started with like the SF12, the AFAS scales were introduced in the early 1990s. Um, some of these are longer, and, and we found recently that patients will get pencil fatigue, or I guess carpal tunnel fatigue for clicking on a, <laughs> on a, on a device. Um, and so we, we have sort of sought to reduce this because if we want to, if we want to collect prompts from everybody, you, they're not going to answer hundred questions. And if they do it, they're going to remember that. And in six months, they're not going to answer it again. Um, and so we, uh, we identified, uh, disease or region specific scales that we could administer. Um, in foot and ankle, we really didn't have one that was widely accepted. So we went to the promise scales. And again, that was largely driven by Charlie and, and Judy Baumhauer. Um, the, the promise scales, as you all know, are, are great because they're domain specific, not disease specific. So we can administer them to all patients in orthopedics and it gives us a common measuring stick um, for every patient and for every condition and for every procedure. So promise is fairly ubiquitous now. Again, this is very largely driven by this institution. Or if you look in PubMed, there's been a, a steady growth in the number of articles published <coughs> using or describing the promise metrics. It's kind of like flattened out at about 300 a year, but that's, that's pretty significant. So these are really, really taken hold. Um, so now, so we understand what we're measuring, we understand why we're measuring it. So now how do we collect the data? And this was, um, this is where I spent a lot of my time. Um, we, uh, we built an outcomes registry for the foot and ankle society called OFAR, Orthopedics Foot and Ankle Registry. Um, and, uh, and it was successful but it was limited, and I'll talk a little bit about why. Um, so that kind of got me thinking, registries are probably not what we need. What we need is something available to the patient at the point of care. And in 2013, when we started that process, nothing like that really existed. It was all about registries. Um, but Charlie and Judy and others um, from around the country had built programs behind their own institutional firewall um, that allowed them to uh, collect PROs and use them at the point of care. So the value of, <clears throat> of patient outcomes really changed. So it's not really about a registry. It's about having the data and having the data available to show to patients. Um, so there's, there are hospital-based registries. You all probably participate in some of these. NISQIP is a, is a common one. A and these have disadvantages because you can't see the data real time. Now, if you want to look it up for a paper, you can do that, but you can't see the data real time, and they generally don't collect PROs because there's no mechanism for it. Um, the health system, uh, a, a health system-based PRO collection mechanism has become more common. Uh, you have one here that's successful, as I understand it. Judy Baumhauer described the system that they have at Rochester, including the costs. Uh, it is not cheap. It is, it is a financial investment to, to build one of these behind your firewall. But it does give you more control um, over how the data is utilized. So the electronic medical records have come a long way in the last couple of years. Epic now has a, a very good PRO tool, um, and most of the EMRs have kind of figured this out and caught on. Um, and so uh, commercial vendors are, are fairly ubiquitous. We looked at all these with our OFAR exploration, and then when OFAR shut down, um, I needed one for, for my institution. So in 2019, uh, we identified Patient IQ, uh, which was at the time uh, a new player, but they kind of did it right. They're a little bit more, more common now. Um, so the AOS registries are, are also something that you participate in. We all participate in. They do have a tool to collect PROs, but it's not very good. Uh, and so we, we, we contribute our PROs, but we kind of do it on our own. So I mentioned OFAR, so this, this was, um, for me, this was a great learning experience. Um, but in the end, so we had four institutions collecting data, and then we realized that some institutions were, were already doing it, right? So some institutions mandated their own PRO collection, so they didn't want to double dip on PROs. AOS was creating a competitive registry. Um, new vendors were, were more efficient. So we realized that we didn't want to be paying a quarter of a million dollars a year when we can do it better uh, with other methods. So that led me to Patient IQ, and, uh, and I built as part of our quality program what I call UCOSMOS, University of Colorado Orthopedic Surgery Measuring Outcomes System. So that is our outcomes program. It's mouthful, so that's why we say UCOSMOS. So what we needed was a user-friendly platform um, that was available on, app, on an app, on a phone, on a tablet, um, that was integrated with Epic, which is our EMR. 
um, automatically enrolled patients not only into their non-surgical pathway when they're seen, but into a surgical pathway once surgery is indicated. Um, they have an analytics dashboard that allows us to show patients real time how they're doing. And it's a really nice satisfier for patients because they can see you know, where they were before or where they are now compared to others in their demographic. And so, um, so that's a really helpful piece. We need it to be efficient. We couldn't have workflow disruption. Most providers won't tolerate a reduction in their clinic volumes or a slowdown in their clinic for this. And so we needed a tool that would, uh, that would allow us to do that and we needed something that was affordable. So we launched in 2019 and as of the end of last year, we have enrolled 287,000 patients, 2.2 uh, million PROMs collected. Um, we have 52 active pathways. That includes registries, like we have a total ankle registry, we have an Achilles repair registry. Um, obviously, we have registries for total joints. We have a PRP registry. So we're able to track specific procedures and keep it in a place that's really easy for us to look at for research or quality assessment purposes. Um, now, this is an interesting point. 66% I don't love. <coughs> We're over 80% for our index surveys and a little bit lower, and it varies. Like our spine group is 90%, and some of our more peripheral groups are, are a lot lower than that. So interest uh, amongst the providers is a really important part of this being successful, um, but still 66% is pretty good. Um, I think AJR is at like 10%. So we're, you know, we're not, we're not uh, we're reasonably proud of that, although there's always room for improvement. So last year we published 15 articles and um, abstracts uh, from our UCosmos uh, data. Um, and then, you know, I get, again, I love, I don't, I'm a visual thinker, so I love dashboards. So what we did this last year is we built an outcomes dashboard that allows us to drill down by provider, by location, by procedure, um, and, and look at um, how many surgeries, what are the outcomes, and we can create a report. And so we've created, <clears throat> we've combined this with our quality dashboard. So we look at the outcome metrics that we re record, and then we look at the quality metrics that we record. And I hired a really smart guy <laughs> as our quality data manager, and we put that together into a singular dashboard. And so we have created what we call a quality scorecard. It started as a value scorecard, but at our institution, it's hard to get the cost data. And so we couldn't get that automated. So we just called this a quality scorecard. So it just has the numerator in that equation. Um, but this is really helpful because we can actually c compare providers. Now we keep it blinded. You know, we just give the data to the chiefs. Um, but it allows us to look at practices. So if, if one provider is lower than the others, we can, we can drill down and see why. Is it because they're not communicating as well with their patients postoperatively and so they're landing back in the ER? Um, is it because their patient population? Is it because of prolonged surgery times that's adding to complication rates? So it's just a visual way for us to see how we're doing and, and surgeons are competitive animals. And so no one wants to be down here. And so this person is gonna do their best to, to, to do better. Uh, and ultimately this can be combined with cost data to create a true value equation or a true value scorecard. Uh, and that's where decisions can be made about the implants that you use and how long a patient <coughs> stays in the hospital, et cetera. So this is, a, this is not a new idea. Uh, Kevin Bozick's uh, group uh, published on this. So they, they introduced a value scorecard for hip and knee arthroplasty. And after nine months of showing this data to the surgeons, they had a reduce in total costs, a reduce in implant costs, a reduced length of stay, and an improved home discharge rate, all of which save money and, and improve outcomes. Um, and there was not an increase in bounce backs to the ER. So this is kind of a, a proven way to do it, and so that's what we're instituting, starting with joints because it's low-hanging fruit for, for lots of reasons, um, but then we're going to extend that to common procedures in foot and ankle and in sports and in spine. Um, and so, and then finally, just, you know, just thinking about the future of, of how we collect data, uh, and this is, you know, again, in 2013, we had almost nothing. We had to use a really archaic vendor to launch our OFAR project, and, and now, you know, patient IQ is one we use. I think they're, they're fairly ubiquitous now. They're actually taking over the academy registry. So they're gonna be the primary um, mechanism for reporting data uh, in the academy registries. They already are for the fracture trauma registry. Um, but you know, all patients have smartphones and it's so much easier for them to enter data and so much easier for us to see the data uh, when, uh, you know, with, with the improved technologies. The medical records are expanding their, their capabilities. They really wanna be competitive with this, which, which is great. Um, there's more interoperability, so um, Epic introduced an app orchard um, so that uh, other vendors like Patient IQ 
can get into the app orchard and we can utilize their, uh, their app within our Epic system. So it's become much easier for us to incorporate um, outside vendors who probably do it a little bit better than we could on our own, certainly less expensively than, <clears throat> than we could on our own. <clears throat> There's more automation. Um, and, and you know, AI and machine learning is really gonna change the landscape. So soon, all the data that we collect about patients, including their, PR, their proms, will be automated. Um, it'll be automatically shared with registries, with you know, other, other efforts that we're involved in, with multi-center studies, and, and make it a lot easier for us to do it more accurately and without all the, all the paperwork. Um, so it, in the end, it, you know, it, it's really important for us as providers, as researchers, um, you know, as clinicians, um, to measure and improve quality. So it's important for us to be thoughtful about it. Um, it's really critical for us to improve patient care, patient processes, patient outcomes, and we need to pay attention to value. Like it's, it's inevitable, like the, <clears throat> the current curve is not sustainable, and we really need to be the ones directing the conversation, because otherwise other people will start to make those decisions for us, and that's almost never good. So we need to be at the table talking about how we assess quality, how we measure quality, what a meaningful outcome is, and how resources should be distributed to help us accomplish that. Um, I want to acknowledge again, uh, Dr. Brodke, Dr. Salzman, and my family. I would not be standing here without these three. So, um, so I appreciate appreciate that, and it's uh, I appreciate you letting me be here. I was promised at least one question. Really interesting, Brian. Thanks. It seems to me that uh, health systems with a larger rural population and the poor, uh, smaller practices would be disadvantaged. Yeah. Having patient population that has access to technology where they connect to their pure arms on their own. What, uh, have you guys foreseen that? Do you have a rural population that you're addressing that with and what solutions can you have going forward for everyone's the same point of view? It's a, it's a really good question. So the question was, with a rural population that may have you know, lower education, less access to technology, and so we don't have the same ability to collect proms, for example. It, in truth, in our system, we don't really, we're not, we're not there yet. Like, our system is Denver, uh, it's um, Colorado Springs, it's Fort Collins, so it's a fairly sophisticated population. Our health system does have a presence in Pueblo, which is a little bit more of that, that rural, less access to, um, to technology. So we're not, we haven't really experienced that yet, um, but it's a really good question. Um, so I, I think that the, the answer is having it available in the clinic, and you, you just have to have the resources to do it by phone. So if you really want to track outcomes, you know, a lot of patients who, who are you know, on the farm or, or not around a lot of technology, aren't going to be answering emails, surveys, and so you have to get a hold of them in person if you really need that data. It's an important challenge. I don't think there's an easy solution. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I thank you for coming. My question here is, the, the wonderful example of the actual work you've done here is fantastic. We've experienced it at the university as well. Um, my, the, the issue, or one of my concerns, to do, and I'd love your thoughts on this, how we then, how we mitigate some of the biases that are the product of the wonderful data. And what I mean by that is, just, and this data gets captured by others who can use it to their benefit, insurance companies and others, and start to qualify doctor or healthcare system not being as good as another based upon this. How do we avoid the no child left behind circumstance yeah. where you now have teachers that select students to take the test to make sure the test gets better scores and they get better funding. How do you stop doctors from only taking care of healthy patients that are active and good and avoiding the maybe more difficult patients that don't get you better scores? How do you protect our patients from the ultimate potential that this may have insurance providers evaluating this? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And there's actually two questions in there. The first is like, how do we keep this data the data that we're accruing and managing from being used for evil. Um, and the answer is don't give it to them. Like we're, this is in internal for us. Like we don't share this with the hospital. We don't, you know, this is just for us. This is for our own quality improvement. 
and it's intentionally never punitive. It's all about just making everyone better. So we're not going to give it to anyone else. The other question is like an important one. So if the payers are saying, all right, well, we're, we're going to pay for a certain amount for this episode of care. We're going to assess you based on the outcomes. It's going to cause many to really think twice. Like, is this someone I can actually get a 20 point improvement on? And if I can't, should I be doing the operation? And it's a good question. And, and cherry picking, I think, is, is an inevitable um, uh, consequence of that. And um, if you are at an academic center, a tertiary referral center, that's where those patients are going to land, right? So if a community provider sees someone who's morbidly obese or is a smoker who needs an operation, but they're not going to have a good outcome, send them to the U, right? I mean, so that's that's kind of the, the issue. Um, I don't think that there's a good answer for it. What's, what CMS has done, at least what I've seen them done, do with MACRA, is they just el eliminate those patients. They have a, they have a, I'm sorry, I should say that differently. Um, they, 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 don't, they don't count those patients toward, like the more complex patients, the revisions are, are sort of like n not considered a part of it. Um, and, uh, and so the, the meetings I went to in MACRA uh, in, in DC, they brought that up and they said, well, if there's increased complexity, that patient could be designated differently and they're not going to count. And so there is a mechanism for that. I don't have a deep enough understanding to know how that happens, but, um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's kind of my thought on it. Yes. Oh, sorry. Do you think that we don't disclose? Because we're all in academics and we, we do get a lot of this information and what like we tell about how we're so great at sending patients home same day surgery and now the CMS removes us from the inpatient only list or how much cost we can save in doing things and we tell insurance by our elastic endeavors how much cheaper we can do the same surgery we've been doing now they pay us less. So I'm not necessarily convinced that we don't disclose the information that we use internal non punitive internal dashboard for quality improvement only. Yeah, well, I think anything collected at the hospital, you're, you're right. And anything that's related to like a, a payment program, you're, you're right. I mean, that's that's public. We think I'm the victim of our own success in a lot of this and are seeing the consequences, right? One other question I have for you is how about how you engage providers? You're a foot and ankle surgeon that doesn't have as many mandates, perhaps, as your arthroplasty colleagues, but maybe your sports colleague or your shoulder colleague. How, how do you get engagement in everybody that may not feel all the same level of um, sort of CMS mandates and uh, engage them in this process? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. And so when, when, we, when we started this, you know, we started with joints because that's where the mandates are and there's only, you know, two procedures. So it's a little simpler and they're very engaged. There's more than two or three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean that as a, I meant that as a compliment, not an insult. I should finish I forgot about revisions, four procedures. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but so, but so I basically what I did is I met with each of the chiefs and I said, what's important to you? Because sports doesn't care about readmissions and, you know, they just don't, they don't have a lot of infections. So they care more about the PROs. So that's what we highlight in that scorecard. So each, each section can choose which elements go into the scorecard. And, and we, we had some guidance from published literature, but we're kind of like, like creating this um, for what's important to us, what's important to our patients. And what's important in spine is different than what's important in foot and ankle. And, you know, I think that mandates and payment programs for other specialties are likely forthcoming, but... I, I don't know, it didn't really happen with macro, so um, who, who knows? Like, I don't know if bunions are ever going to fall underneath this, but I think total ankle replacements probably will. So we all have a reason to pay attention to it, but our focus is really on what's important to our docs, um, and then that allows us to pivot to what we're being told is important by the federal payers and other insurers. Last question I had. Yeah. With, with the CMS mandate, if you are reporting, and as robust of a PRO system as you guys have, have you looked at your actual compliance with the actual CMS rule, which is within a certain number of days pre-op and a certain number of days at one year post-op? Yeah, it's it's a eighty, it's low eighty percent pre-op and sixty mid sixties at a year. But, you know, it's interesting. Like we don't, our joints guys don't could don't they opted out of the six month. Like you said, we don't think it's meaningful. We just do a year, so. I, I convinced them to add it back because some patients just don't fill out their year surveys. I think you have a better capture rate at six months. Um, but it's like, you know, low 80s, you know, initially and, and um, mid 60s at, at a year. Those are our numbers for our general clinic overall that come to clinic and how many of them actually fill out a PRO 
our linked numbers to our surgery is like 15 percent actually Wait, that means that they're filling it out but it's not linked or only 15 percent are filling it out linked to the day of their surgery and it has to be within 60 days pre-op or something like that um, is it right uh, before and then at one year it has to be you know before or after the one year date within you know 60 days on either side yep and the actual number of patients that come in at those exact intervals and that's how we deliver our PROs usually yep where they sent remotely to their clinic visit as opposed to their surgery visit when you link them the data is really really bad yeah and that's a, and that's a that's <coughs> A nationwide problem, I think, um, and it's hard. Like uh, you know, so the the Europeans do this really well. So in, in Great Britain, it, it, the measuring PRO metrics are tied to the the episode of care. So like you can't leave the hospital or check in without filling out your PRO. So they have a really good registry, you know, in total joints and in total ankles because it's mandated. It's part of the health system. We don't really we don't technically have that. There's not really a a big carrot or stick for the patient. But there's a very big one for the hospital, um, and so we're looking at the, the other. The nuance to that is we've built a great program, but the group in Colorado Springs, which is not part of our department but works at our hospital, doesn't. And so we had to build a solution for them as well. And so we kind of built what what we had put together. We built an Epic for that team because they, you know, every patient that has an operation at one of our hospitals has to have an Epic record. And so we'll see how it goes. I mean, we literally just launched it, and uh, you know, we'll see what the success rate is. My my personal, very biased view is, if we're doing better, then everyone in our system should use our system. Um, but you know, uh, the the Epic team is um, there's a lot of institutional pride. So they want they want Epic to be the preferred solution. So we're in a bit of a Pepsi challenge. That's a dated reference, but yeah, uh, Chris. Yeah, thanks. That was great. When we talked yesterday a little bit. You mentioned briefly resources. Obviously not inexpensive to accumulate a team like you guys have put together. Can you just expand on that? Was it largely department initiative? Was there hospital support? How did you go about that? What were the barriers? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I was fortunate that when, when this started, so in 2019, the OFAR registry shut down and I needed another solution. I was asked to be vice chair of quality and we built the Stebbin Hawkins Clinic Denver. And so those three things came together. And so we had some negotiating power with the hospital. And one of the things that we said was, we want to follow outcomes at this center. And so we got hospital financial support. <clears throat> and so right now, our total budget, including um, all of the salaries, um, and it's about $100,000, I think, in um, subscription fees for uh, patient IQ, um, is around 250000 a year. So it's about a quarter million dollars a year. But that's for our entire quality program, not just for outcomes. And so that's for our staff that help manage all the meetings and manage all the databases and, and everything. So yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a small investment. And about half of that is paid by the hospital and half is paid by our department. Common is this doesn't happen randomly. This took a tremendous amount of deliberate, intentional, passionate uh, energy from you and to build up something like this is truly remarkable. And I think it's it. It's it's the best I've seen from any academic centers. Thank you. That's in orthopedics and I Congratulate you. And, uh, we actually looked at IQ and we couldn't figure out how to how to mobilize uh, our resources to uh, generate the enthusiasm within the group to do what you've done. So uh, good on you, and you know, really, um, really proud of everything that you've done. And we'll claim you as a graduate. Um, <laughs> in fact, you may be the only graduate we're claiming right now. <laughs> You still have time. You still have time. The suggestion is that, and it's actually, I think it's it's really important to really understand the question that you always ask. We need as a as a field to stratify patients. And what I mean by that is we need to know how patients in different with different comorbidities in different social circumstances and in, in, in different um, ways of life, it, 
mentally and physically and socially, how that all impacts on their outcomes of whatever we do. You have 2.3 million forms filled out, and so you may be able to, if you can use AI or something to go through the epic charts, you may be able to extract the comorbidities, social circumstances, physical, or whatever, and be able to begin to ask about each of the variables and find out which ones matter, which ones don't matter, and then build a model and then, and then test it predictably and see if it works. Because that's the missing, big missing piece for all of us. What do we need to know just on the way in about the comorbidities of patients? Yeah, no, that's a, and thank you for the comment. That's a really, really good suggestion. Uh, we, we certainly have the data um, and we've built through this um, this Power BI dashboard, I think, the engine. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it takes a team to do what you're saying. So we're, we're, we're doing that on a small level. Like we're looking, you know, we have about 400 patients in our total ankle registry. So we're looking at, um, you know, the impact of, of smoking, you know, former and current. We're looking at, at smaller things. But in terms of like a broad view of comorbidities, and other considerations that, you know, we're, we're looking at the zip code thing, that's got some challenges. But, um, but like, what are, the, what are all the factors that might impact an outcome? And then how do we understand that? And then how do we mitigate that? Um, particularly when it comes to tracking the outcomes in, uh, in those patients. So it's a, it's a great thought. And, and my, my vision would be to have like an, an engine, an institutional engine, where it all comes together, the financial data, the outcomes data, the quality data, um, and and that is sort of the clearinghouse for doing exactly what you what you're suggesting. But it, it takes stats people and money and and infrastructure. But yeah, that that's sort of the logical next step. The point that you're making, Charlie, and that Travis made is um, has been made for mortality. You know, CMS is the actual perspective for mortality. So there's this um, point is the expected is the key piece that we don't have. If yeah. you have an actual over expected and the expected is accurate yeah. based on all the things that you guys are talking about, we would be far better off in, under in trusting and understanding our outcomes uh, and the variables that relate to you know patients that get sent to the university, so to speak. Uh, and it's it's it may be that you know the epic cosmos, not the University of Colorado Cosmos, the epic cosmos is the is gonna have probably maybe already has the most the highest number of, of uh, patient encounters of any single data point. And it may be that that data set could help us because it's national. It's actually, there's worldwide patients in it. Uh, but that data set may be able to do the kinds of things that they've done to be able to create the actual over expected for mortality for hospitals. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and on, the, on the mortality thing, so what we... You know, the, we put together our, our, we have a steer, a mortality steer. And so we really paid attention to orthopedic mortalities because it went up when we became a level one trauma center. And so I, I reached out to some colleagues at top 10 U.S. news institutions and say, like, how's your mortality rate so good? And they said, well, it's easy. We just have another wing of the hospital where we put patients until we figure out if they're going to survive. And then we admit them if we think that they'll survive. And if they don't, yeah. And, and I think Wash U does that. So... It's um, and so I thought that's brilliant. So that that's a harder thing to implement. <laughs> but so but but so the the change we made because as providers we we don't if someone calls and says we want to transfer this patient like we're going to say yes, but we do have now we, so we have an admit to observation and like we you know we take great care of patients obviously but we admit to observation we talk to the family and we decide is admitting this patient and performing an orthopedic intervention going to be you know, the right thing for them and the right thing for the family. And if the decision is yes, we admit them and we intervene. And But if the decision is no, like they choose hospice care or whatever, then we, we have a, a period of time where we can make that decision. And the patient only gets attributed if they're admitted and undergo that, that DRG. So um, that seemed a little cold, but it, it's, I mean, it's the, it's the way that those institutions make the top 10, right? The other thing that they do is they hire a team of coders that are designed towards comorbid condition up coding and making sure they identify things. What what does your institution do? We've yeah, so we, in this room. we we did the same thing. Yeah, so we, we have a we have a coding team and we realized that that we weren't doing as good a job documenting and so in our first mortality review 
um, you know, we saw a, a lot of really sick patients that did not have like a high uh, REM score, a high relative expected mortality. And we said, well, wait a minute, they got all these illnesses, but none of those made it to the coding process. And so it's because it wasn't in the right note. It wasn't in their admission note. So, yeah. And so we've, we've you know, educated, we've built a Epic smart sets to make sure that we're bringing in the comorbidities into, this, into the smart set. And then that That's makes sense. No, no, it, no. It, well, it's 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 the it's the clinical team's job, but it's usually the APPs, and, and you know we're talking about you know spine and trauma and to an extent joints, um, and so the APPs who do the preoperative assessments and admit patients are sort of charged with it. But we made it easier for them with with smart sets. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Thank you again.